Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you are not uh, earth scientists, let alone seismologists, so I'll take you a little bit through uh, the equations of motion that we work with and then talk about how we do imaging uh, using, in our case, spectral element numerical methods and then adjoint techniques for data assimilation. So one slide about the equations we actually solve when we do this. So this seismic wave propagation is governed by a linear wave equation where you have a density times acceleration minus the divergence of the stress is the earthquake source. So it's a linear wave equation where we're interested in the displacement, S. We have a traction-free boundary condition where this is the normal on, say, the, the surface of the Earth and there may be significant topography. We have a set of quiescent initial conditions for the displacement and for the, uh, for the velocity. And then the earthquake source is usually represented by um, a point source. So the source would be located at xs. This is the source time function. And we capture the earthquake itself by this uh, second order tensor, which describes the geometry uh, of, the, uh, of the fault and the magnitude of the earthquake. So these are the equations that we solve numerically. And the way we do that is we use a, a spectral element method. So one slide about that technique. We solve the weak form of the differential equations, just like you do in any uh, weak method, such as the, the classical finite element method. So this then is a test vector dotted with uh, the acceleration. This is the gradient of the test vector with the stress. And then this is the earthquake source. So we, we work with the weak uh, representation of the equations of motion. The nice thing about the weak form is that the boundary conditions, the traction-free boundary conditions, are naturally accommodated. And uh, other types of coupling, for example, coupling between the, the liquid outer core and uh, the solid mantle is accommodated by, um, uh, is naturally accommodated through surface uh, integrals. So they may be explicitly added. So the, uh, the method is based on finite elements. So here you see uh, a bunch of finite elements. This is one finite element, so there are four. And then uh, the, the difference with the, uh, the finite element method is instead of using the same uh, weights that you use for the, uh, to capture the geometry of the problem, we use uh, GLL, gauss labada legendre quadrature on gauss labada legendre points. So here you can see there are five GLL points in each of the three directions. So there are 125 integration points on which we solve the weak form of the differential equations. And then interpolation is done uh, using these Lagrange polynomials. And this is what they look like in one dimension. So this red one is one at the first GLL point, and then it oscillates through zero at all the other GLL points. So these are the basis functions in which we expand the wave field that we're interested in. The, 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 the main advantage of this approach is that this leads uh, to a diagonal mass matrix. So this is why the spectral element method is designed the way it is, GLL quadrature with Lagrange polynomials makes the mass matrix diagonal by construction. And that's why Made, who invented this method, uh, originally uh, uh, chose this particular combination of quadrature and, uh, and basis functions. So that leads to fully explicit time marching schemes. And so what we ultimately end up solving is this uh, symbolic uh, weak form where you have mass matrix, which is diagonal, multiplying the acceleration, a stiffness matrix, and the earthquake source. I should say that when there is um, uh, self-gravitation or rotation, those things complicate the equations of motion, and we do take that into account. So I'm giving you a slightly simplified representation of what, what is actually, uh, actually done. All the simulations we, we do are, are done in parallel. So this is a, an illustration of how we do this. So this is um, graph partitioning of a mesh for Mount St. Helens. So you see here. There's the, the topography. This mesh is split into four pieces. And so this is an example of work by uh, Daniel Peter, who's a postdoc in my group. And he's really uh, uh, brought the software to this, to this point where we, we can run easily on uh, large parallel systems. At the scale of the globe, uh, the way we break the problem into pieces is we start with the cube sphere. So here's the globe projected onto the, the cube. 
And then there's a mapping from the cube to the sphere. So here you see the cube sphere. You can still see the, the top face, the four faces along the equator, and one at the bottom. And then each of those six faces is divided into n by n mesh slices. So we have six, six n squared mesh slices. And this would be one slice of finite elements all the way from the surface to the core metal boundary, through the liquid outer core, into the inner core, and to the center of the Earth. So this is one illustration of what you can do with this software package. So this is a simulation of uh, wave propagation in Daniel Peter's coffee cup. So it's, of course, a whimsical simulation, but it illustrates what you can do with these techniques. So there's liquid, coffee, in the cup. There's an elastic solid, which is the ceramic uh, in the coffee cup. And then we drop uh, a drop at the surface of the, of the coffee. And I'll play it again. So you see the, the, the drop at this point is just an acoustic wave, a sound wave in the liquid. It then hits the, the surface of the ceramic, it generates a, an elastic surface wave, a Rayleigh wave on that surface. You can see it coming down the handle and coming down the side of the cup, and then it will go up in the opposite direction in the handle. So it just illustrates that basically any structure you have, whether it's a, a geologically relevant structure or, or anything else, we can mesh these structures, we can deal with elastic, anelastic, uh, poor elastic wave propagation uh, uh, in a coupled uh, fashion. So this package is open source, it's called SpecFam 3D, and this is the Sesame version. And soon we hope to have a, a working GPU version, a production GPU version of this package. And so this is an active collaboration that involves Daniel, but also uh, Max Reithman, who is here. Max is somewhere in the audience, so he's out of Basel, and he's uh, collaborating with, with uh, I'm not sure this is working very well, with um, Daniel to bring the whole package to GPU computing. It also involves my longtime collaborator, uh, Dmitry Komatic. I think we're losing this. Uh, uh, Olaf Schenk, uh, Schenk at Basel, who is Max's uh, PhD advisor, and then Tarje Nissen-Meyer, Piero Bassini, and Lapo Bashi from the ETH. So it's a, it's a big collaboration to bring, we actually have two packages, this, this one and the global version, to GPU computing. So what I want to spend the rest of the talk doing is uh, showing to you how we now use these numerical techniques to do imaging. So rather than just saying, okay, we have a model, we have an earthquake, we can simulate how these waves propagate through these structures, we want to do better, and we want to actually improve the models uh, that we have of the Earth's interior. So the example I will use is uh, Europe, it's an appropriate uh, topic. And so th the way we do these problems is we, we choose a number of earthquakes. So in this case, 160 earthquakes, and each of these red and white beach balls represents one earthquake. So these are earthquakes on the mid-Atlantic rise, and these are earthquakes coming into the Mediterranean. And then all the triangles are some 338 stations, seismographic stations, from which we have data. And so these stations record the up and down motion of the ground and the horizontal motion on two components. And so the, the lines are just an indication of when you connect these earthquakes to these European receivers, this is the kind of coverage you might expect. Okay? So the goal is now to use the data from these 160 earthquakes as recorded by these seismographic stations and to make a better model of Europe. So the first thing you have to deal with is the European crust. And the crust is a challenge because it's highly variable in thickness, and that's illustrated here. This is a map of crustal thickness. So the crust underneath the oceans is between 6 and 10 kilometers thick, so relatively thin compared to the continental crust, which is 30 to 45, sometimes even 75 kilometers thick. So the way we deal with this is we have a mesh that honors the crustal thickness with one spectral element if it's less than 15 kilometers thick, and that's the blue regions here, and two or three spectral elements if it's more than 25 kilometers thick. So the crust is actually honored by the mesh in these blue and red regions, and only in these white transition regions runs the moho, the boundary between the crust and the mantle, across the elements. And that's illustrated here. So if you look at this cross section here in the northern Atlantic between Greenland and, uh, and uh, Norway, what you see then here is the, is the mesh, and so you see how it's thick, 
underneath Greenland, it thins, only one element underneath the Atlantic, and then it ticks again as we come to the other side. Actually, Greenland is over here, A prime, and this is Scandinavia. And this is a typical mesh, so you see how we have this fine mesh near the top, where we have relatively slow wave speeds, and then the mesh size increases as you go deeper inside the Earth. So this boundary here is the boundary between the upper mantle, about 670 kilometers, and the lower mantle. And the images we're going to be looking at are mostly confined to the upper mantle underneath uh, Europe. So I should say this is a collaboration also in Europe uh, involving the Quest Network. This is a computational seismology effort led by uh, a group out of Munich, Heiner Eigel. And this, this model was designed by Irene Molinari, who is a, a student out of Bologna. So how do we do these? Uh, how, how do, do we do this imaging? Well, basically, what we start with is the current state of the art in global tomography. And that's what this picture shows. So for two model parameters, uh, it doesn't matter so much what they are, but this is shear wave speed of vertically polarized uh, radio waves, uh, shear wave speed of horizontally polarized love waves. And these colors indicate variations in the wave speed. And so what you see is underneath the Atlantic, uh, you have slow you have slow wave speeds. So these red regions are slower than average wave speeds. And then the Eastern Euro pla European platform is relatively fast. You can also vaguely see that the Western Mediterranean is a little slower than the Eastern Mediterranean because it's, it's much younger. And the point really here is that this is where these models currently are. So you see that the length scales are thousands of kilometers. And we want to see what are the structures that we can resolve using these data assimilation techniques and full 3D simulations? And what is the difference between two models? Sorry? Uh, what is the difference between two models? The the, these are just two different parameters. So this is, the, these are both part of the model. So this is the wave speed of a particular type of surface wave called a love wave. This is the wave speed of a particular, another type of surface wave called a Rayleigh wave. So we're interested in both these parameters. And they're both part of the, the part of the inversion. There are more parameters than this, but we'll focus on, on these these wave speeds. Yeah? And I like it if you interrupt me, so feel free. So just an illustration of how this works. Imagine an earthquake here in Greece, recorded by this station in northern Africa in Algiers called Tamarazet. So this would be the path. And as I said, the seismometer records the up and down motion, so this is the vertical component. And in black, you see the data recorded at that station. And in red, you see the simulation for that earthquake based upon that model. So you can see that seismologists understand how these surface waves propagate reasonably well. This is that same radio wave, but now on what is called the radial component of the motion. That's the horizontal component in the direction between the source and the receiver, so in this direction. The love wave that is sensitive to the second parameter is is on this component, this is the love wave, it's sensitive to the transverse motion, which is the horizontal component perpendicular to the path between the source and the receiver, so like this. So here you see how the radio wave is predominantly sensitive to beta v. That's the sensitivity, if you will. It shows you that if you perturb your model in this cigar-shaped region, you will affect the dispersion of the radio wave, which is shown on these two components, whereas the love wave is sensitive to the beta h parameter. You see, this is the sensitivity here, with not, not that much sensitivity to beta v. That's a further illustration of how these two parameters affect two sort of fundamental waves in the seismograph. So we're going to be worrying about fitting these love waves on the transverse and radio waves on the, on the vertical. And we're also interested in these waves that arrive before the, the surface wave, which are called the body waves. These are waves that travel through the mantle and back up to the surface. So that's what the goal is, is to take the remaining differences between the data, the black seismograms, and the simulations, the red seismograms, and reduce the misfit. That's the objective. So the way we do this is we actually partition the misfit in two bits. The first bit is the body weight bit, which is this piece. And there we take everything before these large amplitude surface waves, and we try to adjust the arrival time of the waves to improve the model. So we don't fit the amplitudes, at least not at this stage, we just fit the phase. For the surface waves, those large Rayleigh waves and love waves, 
we fit the dispersion of the wave packet. And that's this second term here. So there are two contributions, body waves and surface waves. And this is the frequency band within which we currently work. So 15 to 40 second uh, body waves and 25 to 150 second surface waves. So up to more than two minute periods uh, in these surface waves. And again, we do it on all three components of the seismometer. So for those of you seismologists, that means PSV waves on the vertical and the radial in the body wave pass band, uh, radio waves on the vertical and the radial in the surface wave pass band, and then SH waves on the transfers and love waves on the, uh, on the transfers in the surface wave case. So the misfit function then involves uh, all these parameters. Uh, this is bulk sound speed. This is that beta V parameter for the radio waves, the beta H parameter for the love waves. This is a, uh, an anisotropic parameter, and this is the density parameter. So after we uh, have made these measurements, we update the model using data assimilation, using adjunct techniques. And so what we're monitoring is how this misfit, and you remember the misfit has these two contributions, the body waves and the surface waves. How is it being reduced, hopefully, as we improve the model? So here you can see how in the first iteration, the misfit in, um, for the body waves, these are the body waves, and these are the surface waves, on the vertical and radial components in these first two columns, and then on the transverse component in the last column. And you can see that in each case, the misfit is reduced, even though the overall misfit is actually the sum of all these six panels, and that reduction in misfit is shown here on the bottom. Okay? So we iteratively reduce the misfit by assimilating these differences between the data and the synthetics in these adjoint calculations. So I'm now going to illustrate how, as we iterate, the model changes with each iteration. So again, this is the starting model here on the left, okay, model M00. And on the right, you're going to see, as we iterate, how the model changes. So this is model 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 14, 18. So we've done 18 iterations so far. So, and this is where we're going to stop for now. So we've gone from this image here on the left to this image over there on the right. And it has a lot of structure in it. All kinds of small scale features are, are beginning to emerge from this very smooth background. And so we're going to take a look at what emerges from these iterations. Before we do that, I'm going to show you how the misfit is behaving as we iterate. So I showed you this step already, where we see the reduction in the misfit on all three components, both for the body waves and the surface waves. So this is iteration two. At this point, we actually changed the frequency band on the surface waves. So we actually started with longer period surface waves, with periods from 50 to 150 seconds. At this point, we're going from 40 to 50 sec 150 seconds. So slowly, we increase the frequency content in the seismograms to try and resolve more detail. So we start at the longer periods where the world is simple, and slowly we change the misfit function. So it's a very peculiar approach to, to this inverse problem, because the misfit function is continually changing. It's changing because the frequency content changes. It changes because as the model improves, we pick up more and more seismograms, and we fit more and more windows. And I'll, I'll get back to that. So then we go in this passband for a few iterations. And then we, uh, again, increase the frequency content, reduce the period. So now we're looking at 30 seconds. I think I've lost this. Uh, we're going to 30 second surface waves. Iteration 12 through, 13, through 14, and then uh, we again change the frequency content. And so this is the shortest period surface waves that we are resolving, 25 seconds to 150 seconds. And you can see that the, mis the, the rate at which we're reducing the misfit is reduced, but it, everything continues to go down. And so finally, here we are at, at 18 iterations. And so this is how the, the, the actual misfit function that we're trying to minimize is behaving. But it's also very comforting to see that for all these subsets that you can think of as, you know, and that makes sense seismologically, we also see this nice steady reduction in misfit. And everything sort of plateaus at a similar level of misfit. Ideally, if the, 
uh, the standard deviations were properly chosen, of course, the misfit should taper off at one. This suggests that the, the, they're, they're a little bit too big, actually. We should be... Um, How do you decide when to switch from one frequency band to the next? It's just uh, based upon our own uh, judgment call. So this is just an illustration of uh, the fact that we're feeling our way into these inverse problems. There is no proper... Uh, mathematical machinery that has been developed that says how we should be doing this. So we're do using our seismological judgment to make these decisions. And uh, it's an interesting topic for, for collaboration with, a, uh, with applied math, mathematicians who, who think about these nonlinear inverse problems. This is a, these are histograms that illustrate where uh, the, the remaining misfit is concentrated as we go from, this is the first model, to the first iteration. So in the first model, this is the distribution of the travel time anomalies that we're seeing, the differences in phase between the observed and simulated seismograms. And you can see that what the first iteration does is it says, okay, I can see that everything is too fast and I'm delaying everything so that it becomes more centered on zero. Right? That's the first iteration. And you basically see that in all the panels. And it also tends to sharpen the distribution a little bit more. And so if we go through this, when we start, in this longer period surface wave band, we're looking at about 38,000 body wave ticks, 20,000 uh, surface wave windows. So now we go through the iterations. This is 8, 12, and there's 18. And so you can see everything becomes nicely centered. So the, the variance is being reduced. and uh, the, the number of windows also has increased quite dramatically as we go to these shorter periods. So now we're looking at 80,000 windows in this shorter period past then, going to about 87,000 windows, places where the data and the synthetics are sufficiently close that we can actually make a measurement and use that measurement to improve the model. So this is a view of, of the model that we obtained. It's at a depth of 75 kilometers. So that's just below the deepest crust. So we're in the mantle, but below the crust. And again, we're looking here at variations in wave speed where blue areas are faster than average and red areas are slower than average. And there's a lot of structure in this map. So let's think a little bit about how this might relate to tectonics. So first of all, here, this red region, that's the Rheingraben, and this here is the Eiffel. And so you can see remnants of that. You can hear me, right? This thing is driving me crazy. You can see remnants of that uh, in, in the uh, shallow upper mantle. This, this slow area, this fast area here in the eastern uh, North Sea, that's the central graben. And those cold, fast areas, rel relatively fast wave speeds, uh, mean this colder material tends to be denser and it tends to pull things down and you get sedimentation on top. So the sediments that you find in the, in the North Sea are a result of the depression induced by these uh, uh, faster, colder, denser uh, regions. This region here is the Bohemian Massif in, uh, in the Czech Republic. That's the Slovakian volcanic field. This is a known contact called the Middle Hungarian Line that runs through Hungary. This is the Pannonian Basin, and when I tell you a little bit about the tectonics of uh, Western Europe, you'll, you'll uh, understand why that basin is sitting there. It's a very thick sedimentary basin with, uh, with a significant expression of slow wave speeds in the mantle related to, there's actually a subduction zone sitting here, the Carpathian uh, subduction zone in the Brancaea Arc. That's the uh, Eastern Alps. This is the Massif Central in southern France. That's the, uh, the uh, Brittany, basically, the American uh, Massif. And then you even see hints of, of uh, volcanism left in, in uh, here, for example, Wales. And I went to the, And this is actually uh, Caledonian volcanism here off the coast of uh, Scotland. So, now a little bit about the, the paleotectonic setting of Western Europe to understand some of the features that we're finding in these maps. 
So this is from work by Wortel and Spuckmann, who've studied the Mediterranean for a long time. So the Western Mediterranean is about 30 million years old. And currently, of course, you're looking at the, the map is what it looks like today. But the boundary between Africa and Europe has migrated in first about an 80 million uh, time frame from over here to where Corsica and Sar Sardinia are now sitting. And then in another 15 million years, they formed the Apennine, the Cal Calabrian Arc, and then the North African margin. Okay, so we have subduction underneath Italy, underneath the Apennines, and subduction here in Calabria. And then this is the boundary between Africa and Europe at this stage. We also have subduction of the African plate underneath the European plate, underneath uh, uh, Crete here. And then this is basically a piece of Africa that still sticks up into Europe, sometimes called the Adriatic plate. And then what we saw in the Carpathians is, again, migration of this trench in the last 30 million years from this location to its current location over here. So this is the Carpathian arc, and this is the Rankea arc. And that Pannonian basin is, is a slow wave speed uh, region in front of that arc. Okay, so now with this uh, very rapid view of uh, uh, European tectonics, let's take a look in cross-section now what, what our model looks like. So this is a view at a depth of about 650 kilometers. And these very fast wave speed regions are related to, there used to be an ocean between Africa and Europe, the Tethys, that has disappeared. And you still see fast uh, lithosphere lying on the boundary between the upper mantle and the lower mantle at this depth. And that's what these two pieces are, the western and the eastern, uh, uh, related to the closing of the Tethys. And that's a cross-section along, cross, uh, along this profile from F to F. So that's uh, the arc right there. And so that's the surface of the Earth. This is the boundary between the upper mantle and lower mantle. And so this map view here is taken basically through here. All right. And so, along this cross-section, I said there should be subduction here underneath the Apennines. We should see the eastern edge of the Adriatic Plate. And we should see this subduction associated with the Carpathians. So, what are these structures that we're looking at here? So, this is where Italy is sitting. So, that here is a slab detachment where the Apennine slab is coming down like this. That's the, the subduction uh, uh, related that, that is now underneath the Apennines here, underneath Italy. That's the Adriatic Plate. That's this portion right here. There's the Pannonian Basin. That's the Carpathian Arc. So that's the subduction uh, here in the Carpathians. That's the Eastern European platform. That's a very fast blue uh, cold region that we saw. And then this is actually subduction of the Hellenic arc coming in on an angle. So remember there's subduction here underneath Greece. It's coming down like this. And in the upper mantle, you see a piece of it coming through like so. So because this history is so complicated, these images are very complicated as well. But you can clearly see all the remnants of what has happened uh, Paleotectonically. Now, this is taking this cross section and moving it south. So, I'll, I'll click you through it. So, let me explain what you're looking at. This is the surface of the Earth. This is Italy. And so, um, it's a vertical cross section at this point through northern Italy. And then here, north of the Black Sea. And again, this is the, the, the top of the mantle. And this is the surface of the Earth. So here you basically see that's the subduction underneath the Apennines. This is the Adriatic Plate. This is the Rankaya Arc coming in. And so we click through. At this point, you can really see that slab. You see this. Uh, Cold old lithosphere that has been piled and is lying on 670. Oops. So 
as we go south, take a look at the behavior of this slab, and you'll see how, as you go further south, there's a detachment. You see it here opening up. That has been noted before by Wortel and Spackmann. So the slab used to be attached. It is now torn. It is no longer attached. And that persists as you go south. Over here, this is the Adriatic plane being subducted to the northeast. Here you can see the Rankea slab coming down. And this is the Calabria, a piece of the Calabria slab here at the end. Okay, so let's pick out uh, one cross section uh, through the, t the boot here of Italy. So this is the cross section, here is Spain. This is what it looks like. So again, this is the, the, the crust. This is the boundary between the man upper, lower mantle and the upper mantle. And we're going to be looking at this piece here, which is this piece here, basically. And so here you see the subduction of the uh, underneath Calabria. And people have looked at this before. So here I'm comparing this cross-section over here from Wortel and Spackmann. That's here. There's the boot of Italy. This is Sardinia. This is the cross-section, the surface of the Earth. And here is uh, 670. And so there, too, you see the subduction of uh, the Calabria slab, that's this here. That's a little bit more stretched. That's this here. But if you look closely, it's actually striking how much this image resembles what we're seeing here. So this thick pile of faster than average material, presumably related to subduction, is this. You see this slower region, which is that. And then you see this faster region, that is that. So even though these, these models are based on very classical seismic inversions of just uh, compressional wave travel times. There are very good similarities between that traditional approach of doing these inverse problems and these iterative uh, inverse problems that we are now doing using full 3D simulations. Another cross section here, a little bit further north. So this is now through northern Italy, where we should be seeing the Rankea slab. So this is. The detachment here, that's the subduction of the Adri Adria plate. This is the Brancaea subduction coming through. So there's the Apennine slab detachment. That's the Dinarite slab, the Adriatic uh, plate being subducted underneath the Dinarites. That's the Brancaea slab uh, dipping to the uh, west. And there's the Hellenic slab again coming through in, in the profile. And then you, you see these remnants of the West Alpine Tethys. So this is how Wortel and Spackmann interpreted uh, what is happening here, where here are the Alps, this is Italy, there's the subduction underneath the Apennines with this detachment where the slab no longer exists. We see that gap in, um, in the blue subduction zone. And then this cold blue stuff lying on the, uh, on the upper mantle. And then in Calabria, the slab almost makes it to the surface, but it's not quite attached anymore. And then also uh, piles down onto the, uh, onto the lower mantle. This is how people view the Adria plate. So as I said, this is basically a piece of Africa that sticks up. So Italy, strictly speaking, is, is African continent. Yeah, so it's rotating underneath the dinner ice. And that's, that's exactly, uh, that fits with the subduction that we are seeing here uh, underneath the dinner ice. So a, a close-up view of some of the, uh, the features that we're seeing in these maps. So as I said, that's the Rhine graph in here. That is actually an image of the Hartz. The Hartz is also an old volcanic uh, center. That was the Bohemian Massive, that central Slovakian uh, volcanic field, the Massif Central. So these are also the, 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 the warmer than average slow wave speed regions that we are uh, resolving in these inversions. There's a, a suggestion of Wales volcanism and there's Caledonia uh, volcanism. So I'll skip this. 
So after we do these inversions, uh, ultimately we have to bring it back to the seismogram. So there are a couple of slides here illustrating what happens as we improve these models. So this is for the starting model, M00, a station here in uh, Eastern Europe, this earthquake on the mid-Atlantic rise, and three components, so the vertical radial transfers, again we see these radio waves, the log waves, and all these body wave arrivals. In black, the data recorded at this seismograph, and in red, the synthetics for the model that we started with. And in each case, I'm going to show you on the right, the same figure, data in black, so the same data on each panel, but now for the 18th iteration model. So you can see that we now capture the dispersion of this radio wave on both the vertical and the radial pretty nicely, also good fits for these body waves, and this is how we capture the dispersion of the love wave on the transverse. Here's the same type of figure, starting model on the left, the station in uh, Norway, Kongsborg, and this earthquake here in uh, Turkey, the initial model, and the final model. So you, again, you can see how after we iterate, the radio wave is nicely captured, good dispersion on the love wave. A very long path from uh, uh, the Mediterranean earthquake to a station in Greenland, these are the initial fits, and these are the final fits. So this is where we are with these European inversions. Um, and I'm giving you a very quick overview of what, where it currently start, stands and what these models currently look like. What I really would like to do is to bring this to the globe and to start doing global imaging using these adjoint uh, type techniques. And so we've started to put together a, a data set of 250 global earthquakes with magnitudes between 5.8 and 7, and this is their distribution, color-coded by depth, so these are shallow earthquakes on the ridges, intermediate earthquakes in green in the subduction zones, and some deep earthquakes from the deep subduction zones in the, in the Pacific. So we're going to take these 250 earthquakes and basically take the same approach here uh, as we are taking in Europe, but bring it to, to uh, global seismology. So one illustration of what global uh, data look like. So here's an earthquake in the uh, Western Pacific recorded in South Africa. These are the data, again, vertical radial transfers. In red, the uh, synthetics, and in black, the data. This is in a 17 to 60 second pass band. This is in a 60 to 150 second pass band. So these are longer period waves where you see the surface waves very nicely, radiant and love, and all these longer period body waves. And at shorter periods, you see these body waves become much more impulsive and there are really good measurements to be made involving the delay and the amplitude of these waves. And so that's the information that we'll be gathering from these 250 earthquakes using the, the, the global seismographic arrays uh, for imaging. So I hope that I've illustrated for you that what we call adjoint tomography is really feasible now. You can do these uh, simulations. The goal is to really fit a complete seismograms, and the way we do that is we break it down in terms of phase, frequency dependent phase, and fre frequency dependent amplitude. We, we're doing this successfully in Europe, and that's my graduate student Hei Jun's uh, PhD project. So Daniel Peter, uh, a former ETH student, now a postdoc at Princeton, is doing this in the Middle East, and then Ebru Bozdak, she's the one who started to do this at the scale of the globe. So a few numbers. Uh, to illustrate what it takes from a computational perspective. So what we're currently doing in Europe, using about 160 earthquakes, 18 iterations corresponds to about 11,000 forward simulations. And that translates on uh, sort of a, a, a typical current node to about 800,000 CPU hours. And so here, this is fairly straightforward on a cluster with, a, say, 3,000 cores. Um, one iteration takes about a day of using the entire cluster. So we're not really limited by CPU power. A lot of it is still data processing, data analysis, making measurements, etc. So we, we do an iteration in about a week. The computations last just a day. Now to go to Europe, or to go to the globe, those 250 earthquakes are going to require about 17,000 simulations. So we're going to be at 14 million core hours, about a factor of 20 more. That's still not outrageous. Right? If I'm nice to Thomas Schultenus or somebody else at a center, I, I might get access to these types of resources. So that's definitely going to be feasible, but you can see why 
uh, Max and Olaf, uh, Max Riefman and Olaf Schenk are, are collaborators because we need more power to get to these types of numbers. Because to do the globe the way I would really like to do it, I would like to take all 5,000 magnitudes, five and a half and greater that have been recorded by the global network in the last, say, 15 years and assimilate them all. So now we're looking at 740 million CPU core hours on today's systems. That's probably a little bit too much. But, you know, five, ten years out, this should be feasible. So this is really within, within range uh, on, on that type of time scale. So the next steps are uh, to do some verification. So we use independent earthquake data sets where we say, okay, we used 160 earthquakes. Now let's take 100 earthquakes that were not part of the inversion and compare the fits to the data uh, for model, the starting model and the final model. And then what you find is that the statistics are basically the same. So it gives you confidence that the model really does uh, represent true structure. We also can do resolution analysis. So I didn't say much about how we do these inverse problems, but we can calculate gradients of misfit functions. We cannot calculate second derivatives. We cannot get Hessians, but we can calculate the action of the Hessian on a perturbation. And so we, we can do blur tests where you put in a, 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 an anomaly and you ask, how well do I get that anomaly back? How well can I resolve that anomaly? And that can be done numerically. And so we're currently are working on these types of resolution tests. Future extensions, as I keep saying, we, we're fitting phase. We are measuring the amplitudes, but we're currently not using them, and that's because amplitudes are really difficult. They are affected by lots of things, focusing and defocusing, but also attenuation, errors in the source mechanism, etc., etc. So phase is very safe. Amplitudes are much more difficult, but these amplitudes contain interesting information about attenuation, and we, we would like to extract that. We, so we know how to do that uh, both mathematically and numerically to incorporate shear attenuation. We also know how to deal with general anisotropy. So these are transversely isotropic models, five elastic parameters. The most general anisotropic parameterization involves 21 elastic parameters. So can we learn something about the anisotropic structure of the Earth using these techniques? Again, theoretically and computationally, it's not a problem. It's just a question of what we can actually resolve with current data sets. So with that, thank you very much.